Welcome to this session on healthy leadership in anxious times. We're delighted to have a wonderful panel together to be able to talk about this important topic as part of the Calvin Symposium on Worship. My name is Kathy Smith. I serve as the Senior Associate Director of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. And I also teach at Calvin University in the area of Congregational Ministry Studies and at Calvin Theological Seminary in Church Polity. And so I'm very interested in these issues of leadership. I'm also a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church. So our focus today will be leadership in anxious times, but also leadership, especially in the church context. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first of all, we have Reverend Dr. Todd Bolsinger, who is a senior fellow of the Dupree Center for Leadership and Associate Professor of Leadership Formation at Fuller Theological Seminary. Todd was the founder of the Fuller Leadership Platform, and he served as a vice president at Fuller for six years. He's the author of several books, including recently this one, Canoeing the Mountains, Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory, a book about leadership in a pandemic time. Isn't that timely? And then this one, Tempered Resilience, How Leaders Are Formed in the Crucible of Change, which arrived in my mailbox yesterday. So I've only skimmed it, but I look forward to reading that um, more. Uh, Todd has also served as a pastor for 27 years. And he serves as a coach and consultant for a lot of different organizations on their leadership practices. So welcome to Todd. Glad to have you with us from California. Then we have uh, Reverend Dr. Micah McCreary, who is the president of New Brunswick Theological Seminary in New Jersey. Uh, he also has served as president and CEO of McCreary and Madison Associates, a psychological and human resources consulting firm. And he's been a professor of psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University for many years, also holding other positions there in the provost's office and in counseling. And he served the church for many years almost 30, I think, or over 30 years as a senior pastor, associate pastor, youth pastor in many roles in the church. So welcome to Dr. McCreary. And then finally, um, we have with us Reverend Tricia Taylor, who is a pastor and a counselor in private practice, author of a couple of books on leadership, okay. including this one, The Leader's Journey, Accepting the Call to Personal and Congregational Transformation, which I've used like a million <laughs> times in my courses. It's a great book. Um, she's also co-owner of a coach, coaching and consulting business by that same name, The Leader's Journey, and host of a podcast by that name as well. And, and she is busy helping leaders and congregations and couples work towards emotional and spiritual health and maturity so they can live with joy in loving relationships and meet the adaptive challenges of our rapidly changing world. So welcome to all of you. A rapidly changing world is what we are in these days, it seems more and more, um, but we're delighted to be able to hear from you and learn from your wisdom and experience. But let me at first here allow each of you to say a little bit more about yourself as you wish and um, tell us a bit about your current role as a leader and your journey into leadership. Um, I'm going to start with Todd. Thank you. It's, it's really fun to be with um, all of you. Um, uh, Tr Trisha Taylor is one of my heroes and I have followed Dr. McCreary's career. So this, this is a great conversation. So whether anybody else uh, gets anything out of it, I'm going to. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, I think the most important thing to add to the bio is um, uh, leaders have to be learners. And one of the reasons why I love the challenge of leadership is what I get to learn, what I get to, I get to be in the middle of it. Um, I find that even my failures end up feeling like they can be constructive. Um, even when things don't work, uh, I get opportunities to learn from them. And so one of the things I love about these kind of conversations is that it puts each of us in a position where we're able to uh, 
uh, continue to grow and develop and and has that been accelerated like crazy this last year right is this this has been um, the most intense time for leadership development for myself my clients my students um, it, it's great to be in this kind of conversation at this moment great thank you Todd um, Micah what would you like to add about your leadership journey wow um I can also say my heroes and heroes are here on the screen. And that's a great thing. It's a powerful thing. And I, it's good to be here. I was thinking, I literally came from working as a director, president of a methadone clinic to come into a seminary. Mm -hmm. And um, looking at that, it, it feels like in some sense, what it says in Second Kings, the company of the prophets. And in a sense, I feel like now I'm, I'm leading the company of the prophets, which have to really be strengthened in order to prevent some of the things that I was seeing happen in the methadone clinic. And that's kind of what I bring um, as well, is that that sense of really being applied in the trenches, whether it's the, the birth as the oldest of seven children to a single, and with this, my mom becoming a single mom later on in my life in Detroit and um, to, to where I am now. It's been a fun journey. Okay. Thank you so much and welcome to you. Uh, Trisha. what would you like to add? Well, I would say the same thing. It's so fun to be um, with these guys. Um, I think I'm just meeting you, um, but I see these guys from time to time and just respect them so much in the work they do. I think what I might say is that I had really gotten to a place where I had learned to use my voice, to see myself as a leader, to say what I see from my place in the world. And you know, really claiming that. And then it was March 2020, right? <laughs> and everything started over. And it felt a little bit like, you know, having my first child and then having my second child, who was nothing like the first child, and you have to start all over and everything you know, you don't know, and everything that works doesn't work. And so I really appreciate um, what Todd said earlier about leaders being learners, because that has been the space for the last several months, for sure. Well, thank you. And thanks again to each of you for being part of this conversation about leadership. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about pastoral leadership in particular. So all of you are pastors, have been pastors, and you've worked with a lot of pastors. You know that pastoral role inside and out, right? Um, so what is it that is unique about pastoral leadership? What is theological about it? And, and how is pastoral leadership different from leadership in other contexts? What are, you know, maybe the challenges of it as well as the benefits? Um, may I start with you, Tricia, and we'll go back? Sure. I mean, there are a lot of ways to answer that question, but that one that comes to mind, especially for the topic of this particular conversation, is that the church family is in some ways unique because we think of it as a family. And anxiety travels in, in church systems like it does through a family. And so you end up with a pastor who is playing a lot of roles that they may not realize that they're playing. Even a 25-year-old as a pastor of the church may be playing the role of father to this congregation. And um, certainly for, let's say, um, you know, a man in his 50s with a doctorate is certainly going to be put in that position in ways that I'm not sure we do that to principals or CEOs in quite the same way that we do it in the church context. We bring a lot of our brokenness um, from family and impose that on church and on pastors. And so that's one thing I think that's unique. Okay, thank you. Um, Todd, would you like to add to that? What do you have to say about pastoral leadership? Yeah, actually, so the only place that I would add to that, because I, I believe that 100%, is I would say that it's even more complex when you're having to deal with like the mission or change mm. because now you're talking about a family business so like <laughs> so, yeah. so 30 33 years ago I married into a family and I didn't realize that I married into a family business now I'm one of those because I'm the shirt tail relative you know I'm the one who married in I had no authority but I got to watch it 
And I got to realize it's really complex, right? So sometimes people in the family get authority just because they're the oldest or because they're the most respected. And sometimes they, the people who are the most competent don't get listened to because they are viewed as marginalized. And, and it, it was really complex to watch, you know, um, family members who all of a sudden had authority over things like, oh, the investments that would lead to my kid's college fund um, would not be somebody I would have hired to be a church secretary. <laughs> um, but, but in a family business, sometimes those roles get confused. And so what happens very often is I would think that, you know, the very first time I ever had to lay off a pastor, that pastor's daughter and my daughter were best friends. So the very first time my daughter experienced the pain of being a pastor's kid was when her daddy helped her best friend's daddy find a new call. Hmm. Those kind of complexities just are, they're difficult. They're difficult to navigate. They take all kinds of wisdom and maturity, but they're also the complexity of it is what is oftentimes not always acknowledged. And that's one of the things that makes it even harder. Okay. Thank you. And Micah, what would you add to this? conversation. I'd add to that, just building that it's really about the authority and the vulnerability um, mm -hmm. happening simultaneously together. And, and that's really the piece is like, we, we have the authority as pastor, but we also have to have that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess one example, I remember when my wife and I were called as one pastor to this one, to this church together. And the senior deacon said point blank, well, who's going to be in charge? And we said, we're going to be in charge. He's like, well, somebody has to be in charge. And he pushed and pushed and pushed until he was in the hospital. And because of my schedule, I couldn't get there. And of course, my wife went. And um, it changed. So she became his pastor in that moment, in that sense of vulnerability for him even. And so it's like the, there's power and vulnerability both in the, in the person of the pastor and in the congregation. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Well, let's, let's continue. These themes, I think, will we'll probably come up as we go along. Um, I've got some individual questions for you at this point, and um, I think I'll begin with Dr. McCreary. You've been a professor of psychology. You've directed counseling programs, as well as, you know, being a pastor and a seminary administrator. But from that experience as a professor of psychology, what do you believe is important for leaders from a psychological perspective at any time, really, but especially in these times? How do you counsel people, you know, from that perspective in these difficult times? Yeah, it makes me think of one of my supervisors said to me early in my training, it's not what you do that's critical. It's what you do with what's been done. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's been the piece of it. It's like this happens to you. It's your response to what's happened that really matters. And how do you respond? And so I think the church, the, the seminary, others, is to equip people to have the skills to respond effectively. Um, that's there for me. And, and one of my favorite tools is to help people dig deeper, to not just settle with the surface aspect of things, but to really recognize that it's the, the systems underneath, it's the core underneath that really has influenced what you're seeing. And then how do you do that? How do you dig deeper? I would be there as well. And of course, yeah. intersectionality, just uh, all these things are connected and, and how you work with that as well. So. Mm -hmm. That's so very important, that, that phrase. I've used that a number of times with employees as well as with students. It's not what happens to you, but how you respond to what happens to you that determines your fate, right? Mm -hmm. it's so much to do with how you respond. Uh, Tricia, you mm -hmm. are co-author of The Leader's Journey, accepting that call to personal and congregational transformation. So tell us a bit about what does it mean for leaders to accept such a call? How, how can they be personally transformed as leaders? And then how does that affect the transformation of the living system of a congregation? I think I can pick up um, right there where Dr. McCreary left off just to be able to say, um, so it's what happens to us and then how we respond to that um, both builds our emotional maturity and is determined by our emotional maturity. And yet, when we think about church leadership, that's often not what's on our minds. I, no one talked to me about emotional maturity in seminary. I learned a lot about what to do with the Bible. Um, I learned a little bit about how to... Um, 
you know, do the work of the congregation, but I didn't learn anything really about how to grow my emotional maturity to a place that I could respond to life's anxieties the way that I believed that I wanted to respond. And so um, I think we start in that book and in the work we do with the assumption that a lot of what we call spiritual maturity is actually emotional maturity. It's, it's being able to take something like the list of the fruit of the spirit and become the kind of person who can live love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and so on. Um, the idea that um, something has, we ha have to be able to grow our ability to live the life that we read about in the books. Because I read so many leadership books that I think, well, if I could do that, if I had the capacity to do that, I would have done that by now. And so the transformation that has to happen is not that I read more books, but that I practice in real life showing up differently. And then I learn from that practice. I reflect prayerfully on that practice. I reflect with a coach or a mentor. Um, and then, so that's the personal side. And we think about it kind of like two feet walking, personal and congregational, personal and congregational. And that happened when... Um, my partner and I, Jim Harrington, um, and a bunch of other really great people here in Houston uh, worked on a project called Leader's Edge where pastors went through a two-year process where we worked really hard on the personal transformation side of things. And we followed up with them later and what they said back to us was, that changed my life and it didn't change my church at all. Mm. And hearing that made us realize there's a congregational and there's a different skill set about helping a congregation to grow its emotional maturity so that it can do the things that God is calling it to do, be who God is calling it to be. Okay, thank you. That's so interesting that as we grow in our own emotional maturity, then the impact is to deepen and strengthen the maturity of the congregation as well. Yeah, well, like they say, it's a system, right? It's a system. Yeah. Um, Todd, you um, recently published this, this book on tempered resilience, which I was going to show here again to get the subtitle, How Leaders Are Formed in the Crucible of Change. Can you tell us what you mean by this idea of practicing resilience or tempered resilience? And why is it important for leaders, especially in times like these, where we've had a pandemic, we've had racial strife and political strife in our country. Um, what is tempered resilience and, and how can that help? Yeah, so um, uh, five years ago, um, when Canoe in the Mountains came out, which is a book really about how to lead when you're not an expert. How do you lead when you get into uncharted territory, when you can't just lead out of your expertise, but you actually have to do practice what's called adaptive leadership, which requires you to learn and face loss and navigate really tricky things like competing values that people hold at the same time and, and are really resistant. What I found is when I would travel around the country speaking about it, everybody wanted me, uh, no matter where they wanted me to talk about adaptive leadership, they all wanted me to talk about the chapter on sabotage. Okay, everybody wanted to talk about that. And, um, and I was working in a seminary at the time. And so I understood really well, like how really, really smart people can be resistant to change. And, um, and uh, what I became aware of was that the most um, soul sucking thing for a leader was when they felt seduced. They felt seduced by people who said, please lead us. We want to be faithful to God's mission in the world. We, you are our leader. Please come. And the minute you start, they resist. That was much more painful than whatever challenge was outside of us was the resistance of the very people who asked you to help them meet that challenge. And so um, I found myself over and over and over again in this place where like Trisha referred to with her work with her and that she and Jim have done, which has just been remarkable around the country. You know, pastors can have an experience or leaders can have an experience where I am personally being transformed and they turn around and go, I just want to give you what I have and we'll do this together. And to realize that the very people who said, yeah, you should lead us are the very people who get, who now resist us. And that process was just demoralizing. I, I had um, 
I had one, um, I, uh, it, it, what I would found wherever I would speak, the most important meeting was with the meal I would have with the person who invited me to speak. So it would be like the district superintendent or the, the bishop or somebody. And they would say, you know, this was really great. Thank you for today. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate your book. But I just don't think I have anybody who can do this. And then I would stop and go, I got to do a better job of training. Oh, my gosh. And they go, no, 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 no. I don't know if we have anybody who has the stomach who can endure this. And then I had a pastor of a really large church say to me, look, Tata, I think I can learn to lead change. I don't know if I can survive it. And so what I realized was there needed to be a quality, a strength, but that strength needed to be able to be met with a kind of wisdom and flexibility. And then I found this amazing line in one of my favorite speeches. And it's one of those lines I overlooked for years. It's um, Dr. Martin Luther King's you know, famous, I have a dream speech. And the part that I've always been aware of is that, that culminating part about our children and the content of our character. But there's this line before it where he literally quotes Isaiah 40. And then he says, with this faith, I go back to the South, which is really a way of saying with this faith, y'all who've been through a lot of pain. Some of you just came from prisons, right? We're going to go back to work. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. We're going to go back and go into the struggle. And then he says, with this faith, we'll be able to hew out of a mountain of despair, stones of hope. Gosh, how do you become a tool that can hew? Not a sledgehammer that bashes through that you'd want to be. And certainly not something that cowers in front of that mountain of despair. And we're talking about you know, our African brother, American brothers and sisters have had 400 years of, of despair. How do you become a tool that can hew? That became for me like the, what I wanted to try to figure out. And what I discovered was this notion of resilience. Tempered tools are tools that can carve and transform and shape. And when I saw that language of the stones of hope, how did, I, it, to me, it's first, it's first Peter language, right? Come to him a living stone and let yourself be as living stones be built into a dwelling place for God? How do we become a place where the presence of God is seen in the world because of the transformation we brought? And what we discovered is that takes resilience and that resilience has to be formed and shaped and has to endure through lots of despair and continue to. And so, um, so that became for me, um, it, it was really listening to leaders who were trying to lead change who said to me, this is really where we need to put more time and energy into developing this quality, this capacity. That's so helpful. Um, before I move to a next topic, would anyone like to respond to anyone else as far as what's been said before? Anything to add at this point? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, this is super helpful uh, concepts that I think are going to resonate with a lot of our listeners. And many of them are pastors, but we also have a lot of listeners, viewers, um, who are in roles, re leadership roles in the church, but they're not serving as pastors or preachers. They're, they're often worship planners and worship leaders. Um, since we're a worship institute, you know, that's the folks that we connect with the most, those who are involved in different roles in worship. So, so here's the question that I'd like to ask. Um, what advice do you have for leaders like those who are, in a way, they're leading worship, you know, this incredibly important practice, um, but they're doing it in between. They're working in between the pastors and the congregation that they lead. It's a, it's a leadership from, from in between. Um, so, so what would your advice be to those kinds of leaders? I'm just going to say, who would like to go first with that one? I'll, I'll jump in. All right. Um, my daughter is actually in that position as a worship leader um, for her church, which my wife and I used to pastor. And she called with a similar conversation, having a new pastor, a new boss now. And it took me to, and forgive the story, but my wife and I's premarital counseling. Um, we are very different. I am the extrovert, the visionary, the prophetic. My wife is the planner, the, you know, introvert, deal with the details. And I, I was deeply in love with her, but I just didn't know if I could marry her because we were so different. We went to counseling and our counselor um, actually knew of my dad and, and knew of some issues I had that I didn't even know. But make a long story short, he gave us the exercise of setting a goal 
and then using some cars to figure out how we got to the goal. We looked at the cars and we were totally different in every way for what we did, but we both obtained our goal. And then we looked at the goal and of course the goals were the same. <laughs> and it really helped me to realize that, you know, often if we just understand where we're headed, we may tr take different paths to get there, but as long as we're on the same page for where we're headed, we'll, we'll do much better. And that's really what I was saying um, to my daughter as a worship leader. The goal is the same, is to really establish this worship setting, to really have this experience. If you're both looking at that, you can work through the differences um, to get to that goal. And that, that, was, that would be my, my thoughts. Great. Thank you. Who's next? Well, let me. Yeah, please. I want you to jump in. Thank, thank you. Um, you know, I've heard for uh, uh, 27 years, I worked in a church setting, and for 17 years, I was the senior pastor who had <laughs> worship leaders. And and I have a great heart for worship leaders because um, I think we put them in a really awkward space. We often want them to be both the soloist. The, you know, we want them to have the soaring voice. We, one of my congregants once said about one of our worship leaders, you know, sh when she sings, God speaks, right? Mm -hmm. Like just, oh my gosh, <laughs> right? But at the same thing, their calling is actually not to be the inspiring. Their calling is to lead the worship. It's to engage the people. It's, a, it's an equipping calling. And I, my heart, during this pandemic part, I have been really aware that, I mean, there are still places in the country, I know it's different, different places where, you know, we're not singing. Like, I haven't sung a hymn or a praise song with anybody except my wife in seven months like I can't wait till the day that I get to sing my faith with a choir behind me so I don't hear how I sing right <laughs> I, I and yet we live in this place so then our worship leaders now we're asking them in many ways to be like production wizards on zoom they're in a really hard place and so my my I think what happens when you're in this hard place is you've got to come back to your core calling mm -hmm. and your core calling always is to equip the church for the work of ministry and worship is more than singing. And worship is really as much about prayer and about communion and service and giving of ourselves. And I'm always reminded that, you know, Jesus is called in the Hebrews, the leader of the worship, the leader, the light our gods. And, and we don't have any Im imagery of Jesus singing. So mm -hmm. that reminds us that there's more to this work. And I think we have minimized the work of worship leaders by um, ask by putting them on a pedestal and in, and by making them like the the music to the lyrics of the pastor, I think you've got to actually have a better understanding of formation and the worship. Of the you know Jamie Smith's favorite famous piece is about the culture, the liturgies that shape us, and we need our worship leaders, especially today, to really be about creating the contexts that shape us. And that's really true for worship leaders working with pastors, who's sometimes the only skill set they keep coming back to is talking like there's 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 other ways of thinking about that so i think this is a very important time for worship leaders to think about their calling as um the people who form the community of worship okay thank you Ted and trisha yeah i want to say yes 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 to everything that's been said and then i'm going to kind of be the ant at the picnic here mm -hmm. and say the thing that I would want to say to worship leaders after they have heard all of that is learn about anxiety, figure it out, learn how it works, learn how it works in the system. And the reason is that in between place that you're describing is just by definition an anxious place. Mm -hmm. We are in really anxious times and have been, I'm going to say, for worship leaders, we have been in anxious times since I was a kid. I mean, I remember the pressures, the worship wars that were happening in my um, Baptist church, you know, in a small town back in the 70s. I mean, it's been a long time that that has been an anxious position in the church. And, and I don't want to um, offend anyone here, but it seems to me that worship ministry is one of the places where anxiety pools in the church system. And if you don't understand how anxiety works and how anxious people show up 
and who you are in the face of anxiety and what your choices are, it will do you in. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, an emotionally mature worship leader who can manage themselves in the face of the, the cultural anxiety, the tension between the pastor and the congregation, the worship leader who can do that, who has um, intentionally practiced that is a gift to the church. It, it gives the church an immune system in that place of vulnerability that it wouldn't have otherwise. Hmm. Kathy, so Kathy could, I, could I ask, could I follow? That notion of anxiety pooling with the worship leader is mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, could you say something more about, just a bit more, Kathy, about like, okay, if they understand how anxiety works, what should be some of the things they, they do with it? Like, how do they, I mean, uh, name it, but what, what else? I mean, I can imagine now a bunch of worship leaders all going, oh my gosh, now what do I do? Like, you just gave me something really big else to do. <laughs> like, I'm not anxious about that at all. <laughs> like, you read our book. That's what you do. Yeah, exactly. But after you've done that, no, we talk about being able to see yourself and then being able to get on the balcony and see the system and then being able to see yourself in the system. And that sounds, I know that sounds like something you'd put on a bumper sticker, but I think it does help us to see what the work is because the worship leader is just in a place where um, people direct a lot of their anxiety into the worship ministry in ways that they may not in other places. And if the worship leader thinks that's personal about them, it will do them in. And so I would say step one is to learn to see anxiety separate from yourself, learn to see it in the system, and then learn to see your own reactivity to it. And once you can see it and you can name it and you can talk about it with a trusted friend or a coach, you're 70% of the way there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just recognizing even that it's there. You know, some people, I think, you know, try to lead without recognizing and then why is everything going wrong? Well, it's that pooling and it's that... Um, you know, all that anxiety that gets focused on a person and they have to realize, like you were saying, that it isn't, in a sense, it's not personal. To the, even though it feels personal, <laughs> it isn't necessarily personal. It's about the whole system. And yet you are a person and you're in it and you have to manage yourself in it, right? Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, um, another sort of angle on the same thing that we are persons and we um, bring our own selves into leadership. Um, we also reflect different cultural contexts. Um, so I'd like to hear what wisdom you have on that topic of cultural context. And uh, maybe I'll start with Dr. McCreary. Um, how do you think leadership is impacted by different cultural contexts so that you know, a leader has to lead effectively out of their own context and background, but they also have to adjust to different cultural contexts within the groups that they are leading. How, how does that work? What advice do you have? It really builds on what Dr. Trisha was saying in the sense of you have to have awareness, knowledge, and then skill. Um, and, and so, you know, the awareness of the self, the self being the instrument that we use, whether you worship leader pastor, et cetera, you're the instrument that God is now using in that moment to bring about, about transformation. Well, that awareness of that, um, you know, I, I do get anxious in these moments or I, I have been here before and I figured out some other skills to do it. That's one of the pieces which helps. But then the, the knowledge um, along with the awareness is, is critical. But then the final piece is to have the skills to do it. And, and I think a lot of people are aware, they're knowledgeable, but they don't really have the skills. And I think the church, some of the skills, of course, are fasting and praying for me. It, it, they seem like things that we just do for spiritual practices, but they're actually the skills that help us to deal with cultural difference as well. Um, when you can really recognize that, you know, I'm a good person, no matter what you think about me. And when you add a good spirit to a good person, I've really got incarnation. Now let me use this to bring about the transformation that's necessary. And so that's the piece for me. It's just 
to walk into that moment at peace that, you know, God's with me. I can handle this no matter how crazy it is, um, you know, and, and it is crazy. I'll be honest. The stuff going on right now is just, just bonkers. But, uh, you know, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Right. So, Todd, how would you um, reflect on that, the idea of your own cultural context and, and the various contexts you lead within? Yeah, so I, so I have two thoughts about it. And um, the one that is more general is that I think we're all beginning to recognize much more profoundly the power of your cultural context. Um, I, I think it's been an un... Uh, it's been an unspoken reality. And part of that unspoken reality and that unconscious ignoring of it is because the dominant culture, what I would call like the white majority culture has thought that it isn't. It's thought mm -hmm. that somehow it's above it. So it, there's the old you know, uh, family systems tale where somebody, you know, two fish are swimming and a bit older fish says, you know, hey boys, how's the water? And one looks at the other and goes, what's water, right? <laughs> like, so like, so, What's happened is that for many of us who come out of the dominant culture, um, we don't think we have a culture. And so what? So now we put hyphens in front of other cultures. And you see this in theolo theology, right? You have African-American theology, you have feminist theology, you have Asian-American theology, Asian theology. Then you just have theology. And what is theology? Uh, white Germans, right? <laughs> it's like, right, so Europeans. What's now we're beginning to recognize is nothing is probably more shaping than the cultural context you're in. And part of the reason we know that, say, in the seminary setting is we now have more online students than ever before. And when you have in online education, you're actually talking to people who are not been pulled out of their context onto a campus to make a different kind of culture, like an academic culture. Mm. You're talking to people who are actually living and learning right in the middle of their cultural context. And so one of the things that, that I think those of us who do coaching and do working with people know better sometimes than our colleagues who just teach in a campus is the power of that context is actually way more important and more powerful than any of your content. Mm -hmm. And what you have to learn is how to, have, how to teach content in such a way that people can both embed it in the context and disrupt where necessary the context. That learning has got both. And this is very complicated and it's really necessary. And, and partly for me, this was even part of my own learning. Like I, I worked in Los Angeles in, in, in Hollywood, in inner city Hollywood in a more diverse church. I went and pastored for 17 years in Orange County in a predominantly white church. I had the same theology, same convictions, everything. When I came back to, to Los Angeles 17 years later, I had students who were disrupting my language because they were basically helping me understand that I was working out of a white normative phrase. My students were farther along than I was, <laughs> like because I'd had 17 years in this beautiful, incredibly lovely, but very homogeneous culture. And I found myself in a position where literally I, I called him and said, I, I need a coach. I, I've been reading articles on cultural competence and I don't, I don't think I have it. And I, I wrote to this coach and I said, look, I, I, I'm a 56 year old white guy. I'm mean, at the time I was 50, about a 50 year old white guy who's been in senior leadership since I was young, mostly in white environments. I got students who are challenging me on cultural competence confidence, would you coach me? And he looked, he wrote me back and said, you're a 50 something white guy who's mostly been in white environments. You're never going to be culturally competent, <laughs> but I will coach you in cultural humility. So I sent him a check. That was like lesson number one. Like I, I needed to see myself differently. And I also needed to see what I brought to the conversation differently and that how much I'd been shaped by cultural context. So leadership it is if you're not paying attention to your cultural context or you think you don't have one, you're, you don't realize that you could be a fish swimming in water and don't even realize how much you are being affected by the water. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's really important for us to have context where we're having conversations across cultures, opening ourselves up to being able to, to the learning that only comes in those, in those environments. Oh, that's so helpful to think about. Um, and even what you were saying about this current context of being online, you know, what impact is that going to have? In a way, it makes us more accessible to each other. And in other ways, it may mask the cultures that are behind us and around us because we're not engaged in an incarnational way. That's something to think about, too. Uh, Tricia, what would you add to this topic about cultural context? 
I might just add that this is a place that our brains work against us because our brains have developed and maybe were even created to perceive difference as threat. It's just the way we are um, at a very basic level. Um, and so what happens is th this happens in us. We perceive the difference as threat and the anxiety starts to emerge. And then we try to shut all that down. But we can't shut down the anxiety without stepping back from the engagement with you know, the other culture or the other person. And so we've done this for you know, decades, hundreds, thousands of years where we move toward people, the anxiety flares up and so then we move away. And we do that over and over and over. And eventually in our lifetimes, we may say, well, it, we just can't do this. This just isn't possible. And everybody goes to their own corners. And this is where, so culture of humility, I just love that, self-awareness. Um, the other piece I would put on the table is curiosity, mm. a really deep curiosity. We say sometimes, I don't know, I imagine it's not original with us, but the idea that the opposite of anxiety is not calm, the opposite of anxiety is curiosity. Because if we can get into a curious space, there's less room for the anxiety. And if you can get everybody in a room in a curious space, miracles happen. And so um, I would just say it is okay for it to be messy. Our brains make it messy. Even when we are trying as hard as we know how to try, our brains will just make it messy. Mm -hmm. And if we can push through that and stay curious, maybe something can happen. That is such a great concept. And it strikes me that if you are in a mode of being curious, that's inherently a humble position, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you're recognizing the other and not pretending like you know it all, you're curious about it. And it's a positive approach um, as well, interest in, in appreciating what is going on in another place or with other people. That's great. Can I add one thought too, as we're talking about that, because I remember when I first came to New Brunswick, we, we've had anti-racism training going on for maybe 14 years before I came. And so I went to the first training my first year here in 2017, and someone told me I could not be racist um, because, you know, as African-American, you have to have power to be a racist. As African-American, I didn't have power. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, but I'm president. And <laughs> I have power, you know. And it was one of those <laughs> moments for the seminary. You know, it's like, we, you know, you've been saying this, you've been repeating this, and it, it fits your, your frame, but we've got to change your frame because... Some of us who are people of color do have power and therefore I can use it in a negative way, which would then, could it be racist? And, and so the growing just continues and, and to, you know, I think there's an anti-racist book out now by Kendi and he actually says that. And so now I've been validated, um, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's just fun. But I, I think we take culture, I guess I'm an athlete um, and, you know, you get injured when you play ball. I mean, you know, and, and I think when you do cultural things, you get injured and it doesn't necessarily stop you from playing the game. It, you just may need to come off the field for a while, get some treatment and then go back on later, you know, and the same with teaching soldiers in anxiety. They come, you know, the best results to PTSD was putting them back on the field after they've been hurt, you know, and so that's, for me, that's the part of this culture thing is like, everybody's my friend, even if you're my enemy. So let's, let's just play, you know. And that's the fun piece. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, in the vein of thinking about in being injured, um, I want to ask you guys what to say about conflict. Um, church leaders always, at some point in their ministries, will have to deal with conflict. Um, Todd, you talked about everybody wants to talk about sabotage, right? Um, so, so tell us, what are some of the strategies that you found to be effective for leading through conflict, for, for keeping people connected in healthy ways in spite of their differences. Um, Trisha, do you wanna start with that one? Sure. Um, so I have learned so much from the Colossian Forum about seeing conflict as discipleship, 
you know, rather than seeing it as um, a curse on the church, to see it as a blessing, that it's the practice arena for our discipleship. Um, but for me personally, what I always come back to is that we have to develop our capacity to be both defined, to be able to be able to clearly and courageously say, this is who I am and what I think and what I believe and what I will or won't do and what I want to be defined, to allow other people to define themselves. And then on the other hand, to be connected, you know, to be appropriately connected with the people in the conflict. Because what we tend to do is to go against people or to move away from people. Right. And really, in a lot of churches, there's maybe the flare up of against and then we go away. And so being able to do both those things at the same time, sometimes we'll say, well, I want to say connected to you. So I can't define myself. I can't say what I think. I'm not going to show up with, you know, the ability to say what I see because I want to stay connected to you. And then other times we go kind of the opposite way. The only way I can be connected to you is if I tell you what I see and you see it the same way. And man, we've got to, um, I do a lot of work with groups, asking them to do a little exercise where they hold on to their deepest convictions in their, in one hand, and then reach out to shake hands back in the days when we could shake hands, reach out to shake hands with the other hand without letting go of what's in the left hand and both those things at the same time. And we have to learn to do that um, if we're going to get through conflict. That is such a, a great concept. And the example of the hands, I actually, I, I know you wrote a, an article about that and I used that last semester in my course, leadership course in, in, a, in a prison program. And these guys really caught on to that and practiced it with each other, the holding your convictions and yet holding on to the other at the same time. That's a it's a really great uh, metaphor for everybody to remember. It wouldn't um, hurt to start a consistory meeting or an elders meeting just starting that way, right? Just to remind everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's really good because so often they do, you know, shake hands around the room. But if we could remember that, that's great. Okay, let's um, hear from the other two of you. Um, uh, Micah, what would you add to the whole idea of how do we deal with conflict as leaders? Yeah, well, for me, um, and it, I guess it starts personally for me in a sense of being the eldest child, um, very troubled environment in the inner city of Detroit growing up during the riots. Riots resulted in PTSD in my dad who had been in the Korean War. He left us and he was my pastor, the person who baptized me, so I valued him. Um, fast forward, brother wind up going to jail for murder. And so all this stuff was in me coming into this. And one of the things that was very helpful was when I read Augsburger's book on care fronting, because as a person who had all this anger and was pushing it down, I needed to figure out a way to deal with the anger. I didn't want it to come out because I thought it would blow up somebody. I would do something like my two favorite men had done. And so to really take his turn, which is that I care enough to confront and I confront in a caring manner. And that was the piece that really helped me. And, and I think I've used it um, for years now in, in the work that I do is that, you know, you've got to connect, you've got to somehow connect and not be so worried that it's going to do it. But if you do it in a way that will bring about healing to be there as well. And then Everett Worthington with his work around restorative um, healing and all and forgiveness um, was also there for me. And how do you help to use forgiveness in the conflict, in the, in the confronting is a piece for me that really helps, you know. And one, one story, I, the, the F story just stays with me. F, I mean, we, we had offices next to each other at VCU. And I remember over this one Christmas break, we're both working in the building. He gets a call that his mother has been murdered. And he goes and he deals with it. I watched the pain of all of this. And then they finally take the killer who had um, had some mental challenges and hurt his mother with a the bat. They're in court and F forgives this guy in court. Um, and it, it just changed his whole ministry, his whole way of knowing psychology, his whole life. And it changed mine um, to see that kind of forgiveness there in that conflicting moment. Um, and that's kind of what's there for me is how do you bring what we are in God um, to these broken moments? Mm. 
Thank you for sharing that powerful story. Todd, your reflections on this matter of conflict. Yeah, as I listened to my two uh, psychologist um, colleagues, I've realized almost everything I've learned about conflict, I've learned um, much more from uh, my wife's a marriage and family therapist. Uh, you know, I, I've learned from that part of, the, of, our, of our field, of our world. It's out of that world. And, and the way in which I think about it, so they're, they're talking about the concept that has been really important to me. It's of differentiation, of self-differentiation. How do you have your own identity and stay connected to other people? Which is not something that we are very good at teaching. I mean, that's what one of the things that Trisha was talking about is like even seminaries, we don't always help people really get that that is a critical life skill. I mean, that's a, that's a critical leadership skill your ability to separ separate yourself from your role, um, you know, that th your ability to be able to hold on to your identity and at the same time realize that the work of this task is to move us together, um, shaping people, shaping a community that can, that can raise up people who can forgive in the face of the kinds of things that uh, Dr. McCreary just talked about, that's, that's leadership work. And um, for me, the framework that I think about it is, it's not as good of an analogy as that Trisha has, and it's not mine. It's, it's, uh, it's the idea of the holding environment that comes out of Ronald Heifetz's work that I often define as like a crock pot. Like if you take a, a it's gotta be safe enough that you can put in you know, raw meat and vegetables and some kind of liquid and you can let it at the right amount of heat over the right amount of time transforms. And if you, and that heat is often conflict. That's really, that's, that's, urgency and um, healthy anxiety, you know, not like um, Ignatius talked about moderate anxiety that is important and it's conflict. And that heat, if you, if you turn it up so hot, if you just let it boil, it will scorch and burn and it's bitter. And you, you know, if you have a meal that's burned, you can't get that bitter taste out no matter how much sugar or cream you add. Like it's just gonna, and many of us have, have that aftertaste in our mouth from previous conflict which makes us really conflict avoidant. But many of our churches today are so afraid of that that what we really do is it's like we turn the crock pot to one degree above room temperature and we hope that over enough time it will be transformed miraculously. And what actually happens is the food spoils before it cooks and it becomes toxic. And when many of our churches are toxic because we have avoided conflict for so long. Mm -hmm. And so we we don't, so this ability to manage heat, like to, I love this notion of creating conflict as discipleship, the, the, that manage is really critical. And what I often say to pastors and leaders that I work with is, don't forget, you're not the person with your hand on the thermostat. You are the thermostat. Hmm. If you can't manage being in that crock pot as the heat goes up, Nobody else is. Actually, they're going to look at you and go, "Oh, oh, pastor, this is obviously way too hard." <laughs> they're they're going to they're they're going to collude with you to turn that heat down, in the name of trying to protect and care for you. So you have to have the capacity to be uncomfortable, step into it, to move one more degree hotter without scorching. You've got to own that as part of your work in order for that transformation to happen. Oh, that is so helpful and such a, a great um, image as well. Though now I'm wondering, is there a new book on the horizon, Crockpot Leadership? <laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe not. That could go in a bad direction. <laughs> well, I've got one more question for, for all of you to ask um, before we complete our time together. Um, recognizing that, well, just to focus on our main theme, uh, leadership in anxious times, uh, 2020 has been a very difficult year. We're recording this in November, um, but those of you who are listening or watching will see this in January. Um, 2020 has been a bad year, and we hope that 2021 will be better, and yet regardless of what happens with the pandemic or regardless of what happens in our country or around the world, many of the conditions that we have here in 2020 are going to continue into the next year. So given that reality, what additional wisdom, words of advice do you have for leaders to be leading in these anxious times going forward. I'm gonna start with Todd and then Micah, then Tricia. So I think that um, one of the phrases that's come out of 2020 in the, the 
pandemic has been the idea of underlying conditions, right? Uh, COVID is particularly lethal to people with underlying conditions. I think about this a lot because my father is 78 years old and has a number of those underlying conditions. If the wrong delivery boy shows up at his house without a mask on, it's really, really dangerous for my dad. So what's happened is what's is in places where there's health, they are actually spending their time focusing on those underlying conditions. What are these things that were here already that now we see? This, this is one of the reasons why um, I think there is a gift in some of the social uprisings that have happened. This is not something that happened this year. This is just brought to the surface things that we are years and years away of, of ignoring. So when you think about that idea of underlying conditions, what I've realized is there's an opportunity in crisis to let the heat that brings these things to the surface to let them to attend to them. So when I work with churches, I spend all my time with them thinking um, there is an opportunity in a crisis to actually do the work of addressing these underlying issues that you've not had the will to confront before to hit the, uh, what Ronald Heifetz calls the organizational reset button and address those things. And so what I would say is whenever anybody's hearing this and wherever we are in 2021, let's just be really, really clear that the issue wasn't about 2020 and it wasn't entirely about the pandemic or about the economic recession or social unrest. It's about our underlying conditions that God is wanting to work in our lives to bring change. And that's why it is long-term discipleship, long-term adaptive change, long-term transformation is needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Micah. Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I would love to use that. Jahari's window had a um, self-disclosure chart that we all use. Mm -hmm. I like to use it more from self-discovery in the sense of there's good to know yourself and know what other people know about you. That's that public part to know yourself, but others don't know, that's that secret part. To not know you and others to know is that, that blind spot that we are, and we need help with that. But I love the part where you don't know and no one else knows. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're in now. That liminal season is what, um, you know, um, Dr. Beaumont called it, where we're, we're in the threshold now, this place where we just don't know what's going on. To me, that's the space for the shepherd. That's the space for, for the divine to where, you know, those of us who have been through anxiety, through troubled spots, we're very comfortable in unknown spaces. And I think it's really finding those kind of communities where, okay, at least one person kind of doesn't know where we're going to go, but they're comfortable going through the valley to the mountain of God. And I see this as that kind of time where those of us who have just come out of the storm recognize that I don't know where this storm is headed, but I'm least I've been in a storm before. Let's let's go, you know, let's go. And uh I would love I had an example when I was a chaplain. Um there was a case that came and, and it was my my colleague's turn to respond to the call. But it was his birthday and his wife had just come. So they were celebrating that. So I said, okay, I'll take the next call. Well the call came in when I responded, when they called the family of the wife, um, she was stable and the husband who had shot her was critical. When they arrived at the hospital, the wife had passed and he was stable. So the family went berserk. They were rolling down the hall, screaming and crying. And I'm a young chaplain, have no idea what to do. And my friend who was a white male tapped me and said, let's go. And we both went, you know, and in the room, I noticed that with this African-American family, He's as engaged and as involved with them doing the therapy, doing the comfort, doing the pastoral work as I was. And it just changed me. It's like, okay, you know, it's not even about race and, and, and gender. It's about just really being able to be with God and do this work. That may help, but those are things that are there. And Thank you. Thank you so much. And Trisha, what would you add? All of that. And... Um, you know, I sit with leaders, mostly congregational leaders, um, all day, every day. And there's, we're starting to talk about how we're not all okay. And we're not as okay as maybe we hoped we would be. 
And I would say, first of all, I think a lot of us are more okay than we think because of exactly what you just said, that um, we just get in there and do it and it's messy. But on the other side, we may learn that that was a liminal space and it was okay that we didn't know everything. Um, a pastor said to me, I guess back in June, I don't know how to do this. And I said, you're not supposed to know how to do this. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to know how to do this. And talked about self-compassion. Because if you ask me, at the end of the day, I'm always going to talk about self-compassion. And just the little bit that I will say about that is that I believe that compassion is the healthy human response to suffering, even if the suffering is your own, right? And so to be able to, for leaders to be able to care for themselves like they care for their people, to um, be able to show grace to themselves like they show grace to others, um, to, to be willing to talk to themselves in their heads like they talk to others. Um, at the end of the day, I think that's what will get us through the, um, I mean, I think here I would go and quote Todd's book where Todd says um, that we have to remember, okay, th this is my language, that anxious people do what anxious people do and it's not personal. And then Todd reminds us that they tackle the quarterback because the quarterback has the ball. They don't tackle the quarterback because they hate the quarterback. They tackle the quarterback because he has the ball. And if you've been leading in 2020, you've had the ball. Mm -hmm. And chances are you are feeling really beat up right now. And so at the end of the day, to receive the grace and compassion of God and to offer it to yourself. That's so important. Such wise words. Um, and to remember that whether we have the ball or not, and what, you know, we're always trying to be faithful with what we've been called to do. And yet at the end of the day, it is God's church, you know, and in a certain sense, hard as we do work and as we must work, uh, we can have confidence that, that um, God will lead the church and, um, and we can do our part as faithfully as we can. But I don't know about you, but I find comfort in that, um, in that reassurance that it doesn't all depend on me. <laughs> Even though I can't opt out, I still have my responsibilities, but it doesn't all depend on me. Well, you have all given us such great wisdom today. I so appreciate your willingness to be with us. And I'm sure that this uh, session, as it's watched and listened to in the future, will be really helpful for many pastors and leaders in the church. So thank you so much for being willing to be part of this. Blessings to each of you in this, in this new year ahead and beyond. And may God bless your ministries and your leadership and the way that you share that with so many. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.